Okay, this is uh, the end of the chapter for drug use and abuse. This is chapter nine. We're talking about treatments. Uh, individual therapies explore the, the reasons for the addict's continuing use of psychoactive substances and identify all areas of intervention needs with the aims of changing the client's behavior. And there's a lot of individual therapies that you can use, cognitive behavioral therapy, reality therapy, aversion therapy, psychodynamic therapy, art therapy, assertiveness training, motivational interviewing or enhancement, and social skills training. And of course, uh, we will go over those, not today in, in this class, but uh, in other classes dealing with uh, different techniques for, for uh, therapy. Motivational interviewing and motivational enhancement therapy uh, is used as a non-confrontational style to help the addict change ambivalence about drug use uh, in, into the desire to change. Um, one of the things uh, that we get them to, one of the things that is used is uh, expressing empathy uh, for the, the individual's problems, uh, allow resistance to happen and to explore their, uh, their problems and the reasons that they are resisting uh, changing, uh, develop disciplinary discrepancy between what is wanted and what is had, and uh, of course, uh, supporting self-efficacy. With motivational interviewing and motivational enhancement, the client will go through five stages. The first is pre-contemplation stage. Those of you who have had uh, Psych 291, uh, we're going to go through <laughs> uh, what we talk about in, in that class. Uh, pre-contemplation is where they will not admit that they have a problem. This is where most uh, addicts are when they uh, first come in for treatment. Uh, the contemplation stage where the client begins to think that they may have a problem, but they may have a problem. Determination where the client decides to do something about their problem. Action where the client chooses a strategy. And maintenance where the client actively works on maintaining their strategy. Group therapy helps the individual break the isolation that chemical dependency induces. Uh, facilitated groups consist of six or, seven, uh, six or more clients who meet daily, weekly, or monthly. Uh, peer groups have the same structure as the fa facilitated group, but with less direction from the therapist. Self-help groups are another type of uh, group therapy. Uh, they are fa not facilitated by a therapist, but are maintained by a layperson. Uh, if you watch, uh, what's it, Mom, I think is the name of the television show, uh, the two people, uh, the mo mother and the daughter, are both alcoholics, uh, and uh, the daughter has a gambling problem. It's a comedy, as odd as that may seem, uh, but of course it is run by uh, uh, people in the group. It's not run by a therapist. Alcoholics Anonymous is one type uh, of self-help group, Narcotics Anonymous, Crystal Meth Anonymous, Cocaine Anonymous, Marijuana Anonymous, Gamblers Anonymous, Overeaters Anonymous, Sexaholics Anonymous, and Debtors Anonymous. Addiction is a family disease as it impacts all the members of the family. The addict's family is often ignored and neglected in the pursuit of the pleasure or oblivion that is caused by the drug. Addicts are very selfish people. Uh, family members must accept the addiction as a treatable disease the family must establish a drug-free family system. The family must develop a system for family communication. The family must process the readjustment. Lots of adjustments to take place. Uh, if this individual has been an addict and it is, has been known to the family, uh, then one thing that they have been doing is enabling. And we'll talk about enabling in just a second. But the, the family has uh, developed around uh, this addiction, alcoholism, uh, uh, smoking or whatever, and they are they have uh, developed means of coping with uh, this person's problem, whether it's mom, dad, or one of the children. Family approaches, uh, family systems approach focuses on daily routines, family rituals, and short-term problem-solving strategies. Family behavioral approach focuses on the behaviors peculiar to the family associated with drug use. Family functioning approach seeks to repair the functioning of the family to prevent relapse from addict from the addict. 
uh, social network approach. The family breaks their isolation and develops skills to seek support to their recovery effort. Tough love approach. Family uh, sets limits for their interaction with the addict. And that is that. Codependents are dependent on the addiction of the addict to fulfill some need that they, that they have. Uh, there was a, t a movie uh, with Andy Garcia and Meg Ryan uh, where Meg Ryan was an alcoholic and it turned out that their relationship was based on her uh, being fun and uh, being sexy when she was drunk. Uh, so when she wasn't drunk anymore, the relationship kind of faltered. Uh, another example would be uh, 28 Days with Sandra Bullock. Um, her relationship with her boyfriend uh, had to do with her being a really fun person. And of course, he wanted her to be that fun person. Uh, the addiction may allow the non-addicted partner to control the relationship. The addiction may allow the non-addict uh, to overcome, overlook their own shortcomings or problems. The non-addicted partner promotes the addiction and becomes part of the dysfunction. In order to promote recovery, the codependency must be articulated and their behavior changed. I, was, uh, I had a student uh, when I was up at Fort Belknap. Uh, her problem was codependency. She found men who uh, needed her, and uh, sometimes it was drugs, sometimes it was, it was other things. It was uh, their low self-esteem. Uh, but she founded men who needed her, and she had a problem with codependency. And she had to go to, to uh, treatment. She had to go to counseling uh, on several different occasions because she uh, would only fall in love with weak men or with men who had a problem that she could um, uh, would would allow her to manipulate that individual. She couldn't. Uh, she couldn't handle a strong. Uh, a man who could handle uh, himself. She needed somebody with weakness, and that was her codependency. Really kind of interesting. Families caught in uh, a circumstance of addiction and denial will often dance around the problem rather than confront the addiction head on. This is a, a basic problem because a lot of times it's the breadwinner of the family that's the addict, and he gets angry, and he uses his anger, or he uses, uh, he th makes threatening uh, gestures toward the family. Maybe they're physically threatening or maybe they're just financially threatening. Uh, and of course, they're afraid to confront him about his problem. Uh, so they kind of dance around the fact that the old man's got a, a drinking problem. Or it could be mom. Uh, my, uh, my wife, uh, her um, her aunt was an alcoholic, and uh, the family wouldn't deal with it, and eventually she committed suicide. Uh, but because they wouldn't deal with this, is this is in the uh, South, and it was considered to be a, a an acceptable practice for for people to drink their uh, mint juleps in the afternoon, which is a very strong drink, by the way. Um, anyway. These are problems. This refusal to deal with the problem actually helps the addict maintain their addiction. This form of mass denial perpetuating the, the addictive behavior is referred to as enabling. And of course, that's what was happening in that family. Uh, the father uh, loved her very much, and he didn't want to uh, antagonize her. He was afraid she would leave him. Uh, he thought she was gorgeous, and he was, uh, he was a pug ugly guy. Uh, actually, he wasn't that bad looking, but uh, he had convinced himself that the only way to keep her was to keep her happy, and the only way to keep her happy was allow her to drink. And um, uh, eventually, as I said, she committed suicide. I'm not ex he, he was an enabler. Uh, all the uh, children in the family were told not to bother mom, uh, let her do what she needs to do so that she to, to keep her happy. And, of course, they grew up uh, as enablers, all three of the children. Uh, and one of the children became an alcoholic because that was a way to manipulate, that was a way to control uh, their, their lives was to, by drinking. Children of addicts uh, develop enabling roles that eventually become ingrained as maladaptive behavioral patterns that are perpetuated into adulthood. They include the model child, the problem child, the lost child, 
the mascot child or the family clown. It's, and this is really fascinating. Uh, uh, if you know anybody who uh, comes from an alcoholic family, you can uh, actually identify these these four different types of individuals. Now, a lot of times, if there's more than one kid in the family, then uh, you'll have a you'll have one of each of these in in the family, or maybe there will be two model children, or two lost children, or two problem children. Or usually there's only one uh, family mascot or family clown. Uh, it tends to be the youngest ind individual in the family is the mascot or the family clown, but it doesn't have to be. The model child hides the dysfunction of their families by becoming high achievers and overly responsible. Uh, they're the biggest enablers for their parents' addiction because they take over the roles and responsibilities of their parents. Now that's something that they do and... Uh, we, I had a colleague once who both of her parents were alcoholics and she was an only child and she was the model child of course and she became this individual and uh, as she got older she of course married <laughs> she of course married an, uh, an alcoholic uh, who her parents weren't abusive they weren't abusive alcoholics uh, but her husband was and of course you know it's, it's just not fitting the scenario that she you know, she was. She wanted to marry somebody that she could, uh, she could uh, enable and and uh, manipulate, and it just didn't turn out that way. He was he was an abusive individual, uh, but uh, these individuals very very often will marry other will will marry alcoholics. She's not an alcoholic. She hates alcohol. As a matter of fact, she became an alcohol uh, abuse counselor. Uh, but uh, you know her life certainly didn't turn out the way that she thought it would. She she claimed she swore to herself that she'd stay away from uh, people that drank. But of course she was drawn to them because as far as she was concerned, she grew up with this in the family, uh, and uh, and that was attractive to her. It was it was attractive when somebody was that type of an individual, and so she, that's what she was drawn to. Uh, she wasn't drawn to anybody else. It could have been the most perfect man in the world, but if he wasn't a, a drinker, then, then he, she saw him as weak, as weird as that may seem. The problem child reflects the behavior of their parents. These individuals have continual and multiple personal problems. They often participate in early drug and alcohol addiction. They demand and get what little attention the parents can give to their family because they act out. And because of that, of course, these individuals uh, do tend to become alcoholics. And in the uh, family that I was talking about, one of the children is the problem child. He was the one that was always getting into trouble, and his brother had to bail him out. And that, that is a really serious problem. Uh, this guy is still an addict. Uh, he lives in, he, he's homeless. Uh, he doesn't have a home uh, to go to. Uh, he raised both of his children as as uh, drug addicts, as weird as that seems. He gave his children marijuana to smoke when they were they were still in elementary school. As strange as that may seem, one of them turned out okay. As odd as that may seem, uh, but one of them turned out. Uh, one of the male uh, became prostitute, male prostitute. Uh, he got into all kinds of trouble. He stabbed somebody. Uh, he went to rehab. Uh, tr they tried to get him out of that uh, that life cycle, that lifestyle, and uh, he just couldn't do it. He just wouldn't do it. Uh, and now he's in an addict with his dad. That was, we need to congratulate him for fulfilling his destiny, I guess. Lost children are withdrawn. Uh, they act spaced out as if there's so much going on in their minds and they can't acknowledge anyone else. Uh, they seem disconnected from life and any emotions around them. They are unable to form close friendships or intimate bonds with others because they avoid emotionally confronting issues. They can't handle them, and they'll run away. They, they become runaways. They become cutters. Uh, these individuals are... are uh, that, that's the way they uh, cope with their uh, family situation. They, they escape from it. Family mascots or family clowns are able to avoid family problems by trivializing or making jokes of serious issues. They tend to have many friends because of their humor, but only deal with life in a superficial manner because of their desire to reduce everything into something humorous. 
that are always looking for the the funny part of of life. They're, everything is is humorous to them. <clears throat> And these individuals, of course, all, all of these individuals are more likely to marry uh, other alcoholics because, as I said before, with the uh, the uh, golden child, with the uh, uh, with the anointed one, uh, those individuals, uh, oh, that's all they see as, as attractive uh, is somebody who is just like mom or just like dad, whatever the, whichever the case may be. As adults, children of alcoholics are isolated and afraid of people and authority figures because their parents have always been ducking these individuals. Uh, they don't want to be stopped by the cops, so they say negative things about the police. There are approval seekers and lose their identity because of it. Uh, I'd like to refer to them as malleable people. Uh, they'll do anything to, uh, for, for, to, to get people to uh, acknowledge them. They are frightened by angry people and personal criticism. Uh, be, they become or marry alcoholics or other addicted people. And this is because enabling is attractive to them. Uh, children of alcoholics feel guilty when standing up for themselves. They become addicted to excitement and stimulation. Uh, they confuse love and pity and seek people who need to be pitied and rescued. And of course, the other alcoholics or uh, alcoholics are the perfect types of individuals. They repress feelings from traumatic childhoods. They judge themselves harshly and have low self-esteem. They are reactors rather than initiators. Adult Children of Alcoholics is a 12-step program to help adult children sift through the emotional baggage of their childhood. Uh, they understand the disease of addiction and develop forgiveness for their parents. Uh, they learn to understand the disease of addiction. They put themselves on top of their priority list. Uh, they detach from love because love has uh, is what is the excuse that they use for doing for uh, enabling their uh, addicted parents. They feel, accept, and express feelings and build self-esteem. They learn to love themselves. Uh, alcohol, alcoholics, uh, other addicted. Addictive people are so needy that they force everyone around them to show them love. And if you do this with a child, then sometimes they don't learn to like themselves. And of course, that is a problem. Polydrug abuse, uh, aggressive treatment programs need to be developed to treat all of the client's addictions. Heroin addicts may also have a drinking problem. Many substance abusers may also maintain serious behavioral addictions. One problem with, uh, will trigger the other addictive behavior, allowing the addict to drift from one problem to the other. Actually, they bounce from one to the other. So if you, if you treat them for one thing, then they will bounce over to their, their other type of addiction. Uh, until both problems are addressed, neither can be taken care of. So if we have a, somebody who uses depression as a way to rationalize their alcoholism, you need to deal with both of them, but you need to cure their alcoholism first before you deal with their depression. Uh, if you don't, uh, then it's they're just going to go. They're they're just going to wander over to the other one, and now you've got now and eventually, of course, they'll they'll flip flop between the two. Methamphetamine uh, methamphetamine abusers tend to be male, white, and gay or bisexual. Psychiatric symptoms that often accompany stimulant abuse include schizophrenia, paranoia, a major depression, and bipolar disorder. Now, why in the world would this be? Because when you use methamphetamine, it mirrors psychosis. And that's one of the reasons why all of these are really severe. The schizophrenia, paranoia, major depression, which is a, uh, can be a form of psychosis and bipolar disorder. Evaluation of the problem will have to be done in order to determine if it is caused by the abuse. And that is a problem. Stimulant abusers tend to respond positively to, to traditional drug counseling approaches along with the following medications. Uh, antidepressants, antipsychotic medications, uh, sedatives, nutritional supplements, because, hey, these guys have been using meth and they don't eat, um, and uh, they, they caring about what they look like is the last thing on their minds. Otherwise, they wouldn't do it. 
uh, dopamine agonists and anti-epileptic uh, drugs. Anti-epileptic drugs, of course, are the treatment for, is a normal treatment for uh, bipolar disorder. Long-term cravings for stimulants can be caused from the dopamine depletion. There are several medications that can stimulate dopamine release and stop the endogenous cravings. Exogenous cravings are often stronger than endogenous cravings and can be treated with counseling, group sessions, and desensitization techniques. Exogenous outside the body, endogenous inside the body. Cocaine aversion therapy can also can be used. Disulfiram uh, will cause aversive physical consequences if cocaine is used. Abstinence is the only acceptable result from uh, tobacco cessation therapy. Failure rate for tobacco cessation is higher than any other addictive substances. It's not that hard to get people off of something, but to get people to quit smoking very, very, uh, has a very, very low percentage. 70% of smokers want to quit. 46% attempt to quit each year. Success rates for the types of uh, pharmacological treatment include nicotine patches, 17.7% uh, uh, success rate, nicotine inhaler, 22.8% uh, success rate, nicotine gum, 23.7% success rate, Zyban, 30.5% uh, success rate, uh, nicotine spray, about the same as Zyban, 30.5% uh, uh, success, combination of any two, 28.6%. Chantix, 44%. But there is a problem with Chantix. Chantix takes away, blocks your dopamine. And since it blocks your dopamine, uh, since it blocks your dopamine, you tend to have um, bad dreams. Uh, there are a, a lot of side effects to Chantix that, uh, that uh, make people uh, not able to, uh, to continue using it. And it only has a 44% success rate. As you can see, those success rates are pretty abysmal. Nicotine patches work so well because they give a steady rate of release of nicotine. The, the ease of compliance, you just stick it on your arm and you don't have to worry about it until, uh, until the next day when you put another patch on. Lack of, lack of toxic effects uh, to tissues in the mouth, the lungs, and the digestive tract. Uh, problems include the cost. It's kind of expensive. Uh, inability to alter the amount being absorbed. Uh, the patch has so much nicotine in it, and that's it. The length of time it takes to raise the nicotine level uh, takes about four to six hours for these things to, to, to seep into your system. If the user is smoking while wearing the patch, it may raise the plasma nicotine levels to dangerous levels. And of course, this is a problem. This is why they tell you not to do things like that. Uh, nicotine is toxic. Nicotine is poison. You can poison somebody with 100 milligrams of nicotine. You could kill them. They will die. Uh, so you've got to be really careful. This stuff will build up in your system, especially with the nicotine patch. Uh, it'll build up in your system, and potentially you can make somebody really sick. Nicotine gum has the advantage of raising the nicotine level rapidly and maintaining it for a number of minutes. Remember, it took four to six hours for that patch to work. Uh, nicotine gum, only 15 to 30 minutes. Uh, and this usually curbs the craving. The user seems to have more control over the doses than with the patch. The user can chew too much gum and get an adverse reaction. Remember, nicotine is toxic. Uh, the gum irritates the mucosal tissue. The gum supports an oral addiction, uh, where the individual is chomping away on gum all the time. Nicotrol uh, is a nicotine nasal spray. It's self-administered and reaches the brain in three to five minutes. It relieves the craving in a short time. The disadvantages to its use include irritation to the nasal passage, and it reinforces nicotine addiction. Nicotrol also has an inhaler that allows the fastest relief for nicotine craving without inhaling all the other destructive chemicals in cigarettes. Nicotine, nicotine lozenges actually contain 60% tobacco and deliver one milligram of nicotine and can be used wherever the individual cannot smoke. Withdrawal symptoms from nicotine include anxiety, depression, and craving. These can, of course, be uh, reduced by the medications. We already talked about Chantix and Zyban, uh, but also benzodiazepine, buspirone, uh, Prozac, and, or clonidine. 
Tobacco cessation therapy is similar to that of any psychoactive substance, but has a lower rate of success at from 15 to 30 percent. This is cessation therapy. Only about 10 percent of the people who tried to quit smoking are successful. Uh, of course, the cessation therapy uh, techniques uh, are a little bit more successful than going cold turkey. You've seen it on television, the turkey walking around trying to get off of tobacco. The techniques used include desensitizing the smoker to the environment, practicing alternate uh, methods of calming oneself, avoiding environments where smoking is rampant, find other ways of getting the small rush or mild euphoria like running, uh, teach the user the physio physiology of nicotine and the medical consequences of smoking or chewing tobacco. Teach the user the extraordinary benefits of quitting. Uh, up north, uh, they do a lot of rodeo riding up there, and the big thing is to have that circle on your, on the um, uh, seat of your pants, uh, the po back pocket of your pants. I can't remember which pocket you're supposed to put it in. It's left or right. Anyway, having that circle on your pants is a is a badge of stupidity for one thing, but it's it's also a badge that you're with it, you know. Uh, I had uh, two friends who had uh, up there who uh, were had been rodeo people, and uh, of course both of them dipped snuff, uh, and both of them tried to quit, and one of them used uh, gum, one of them used the gum, the other one used patches, and uh, one of them was successful for about four months, but then he went back to it for for no reason whatsoever. The other one. Uh, was never ever successful. He kept chewing the gum and trying not to dip the snuff, uh, but uh, he never was able to uh, to stop. Heroin detoxification is done with methadone and buprenorphine, uh, where they are administered in, in place of the heroin and then slowly tapered off. Uh, after detoxification, naltrexone will be administered to decrease cravings and ensure abstinence. Uh, Follow-up treatment is conducted in individual counseling sessions, group sessions, and self-help groups. The individual will be required to attend counseling sessions daily for four to eight weeks after detoxification. And for this reason, uh, a lot of times in individuals who are, are uh, trying to come off of heroin uh, will have to go to a, uh, a treatment uh, facility. And, uh, you know, they have to have these counseling sessions every day. For four to six weeks now six to eight weeks now we know that heroin's not any more addictive than than other substances why in the world uh, do uh, do uh, heroin addicts uh, relapse and the answer is because of the euphoric feeling that's what they're looking for the key uh, to recovery from opioid addiction is learning a new lifestyle methadone replacement therapy was used by 200,000 uh, heroin addicts in, in 1,069 methadone maintenance clinics in 2005. This is in the United States, of course. Methadone is ideal for heroin addiction because it is longer lasting but not as strong, allowing the addict to slowly decrease usage without withdrawal symptoms. Methadone can be dispensed without the danger of a high-risk high lifestyle that has led to infection of IV drug users with HIV and hepatitis C. However, there are many in the treatment community that do not like treating one addiction with another with another drug. And for that reason, of course, uh, there are some people that will uh, uh, not prescribe uh, methadone uh, replacement therapy. Buprenorphine uh, is used to treat heroin addiction through a high-dose sublingual tablet. Uh, high, uh, at high doses, buprenorphine uh, acts as an opioid receptor antagonist. Subutex is used during the early stages of detoxification, and sub sub suboxone is used during the maintenance phase. Suboxone can be used to stabilize the user when they are detoxifying from methadone maintenance. Sedative and tranquilizer abusers tend to be older, white, and female. 41% uh, of the tranquilizer abusers and 33% of sedative abusers in treatment report concurrent alcohol use, while 18% report the use of marijuana. Most detoxification of sedative hypnotic addiction 
requires substitution therapy. That is, uh, this is uh, done mostly with long duration phenobarbital. Uh, butabarbital may be substituted for phenobarbital, and dilantin, tegretol, or neurontin uh, may be administered to prevent seizures, as ugly as that is. This type of medical uh, management must be done daily. Abstinence of sedative hypnotic requires. <laughs> I'm sorry, I need a drink. Abstinence of sedative hypnotics <clears throat> requires intensive uh, participation in the group, in group, individual, and educational counseling. Some addicts report bizarre taste and visual distortions for several months. Uh, some report violent mood swings or rage or, or anger. Uh, rebound re withdrawal symptoms are reported by some addicts for several months after the initial withdrawal despite total abstinence. Uh, SSRIs and boost bar are sometimes used to, to address the underlying psychiatric problems that led to the, the use of sedative hypnotics in the first place. In other words, we're trying to, to relieve their uh, anxiety. 21.5% of all treatment admissions are due to alcohol. There's a shock for you. In 17.5% of the cases, there was a concurrent abuse taking place. 61% of the time, the concurrent abuse substance was marijuana. Ugh, now, let's think about this for a minute. Now, why in the world would marijuana and alcohol cause uh, so much trouble? And the answer is you're using two addictive substances. Uh, there's there's some self-medication taking place. Alcoholics, more than any other addicts, have a hard time admitting that they have a problem because it is socially acceptable. We may have this problem with marijuana in the future if we legalize it in the United States. Alcoholics are in denial. Part of this is due to the interference between alcohol and judgment. They don't see the association between alcohol and their problems. Whatever problems they have, alcohol didn't have anything to do with it. Detoxification from alcohol is one of the more medically dangerous detoxifications of any of the psychoactive substances. For an individual coming off alcohol, the withdrawal symptoms are very uncomfortable. Delirium tremens, uh, which is uh, characterized by confusion, hallucinations, agitation, uncontrollable tremors, uh, and paranoia. Uh, they will go into seizures, and this is usually what kills them. Uh, these symptoms begin two to three days after the last drink and begin to dissipate after five days. But on that, uh, that third and fourth day uh, and fifth day, uh, seizures are, are not that uncommon. And like I said, it's usually the seizures that kill the individual. Alcohol withdrawals can be treated with barbiturates, benzodiazepines, Librium, uh, peraldehyde, chloral hydrate, phen phenothiazines, anabuse, naltrexone, and camprol. Now remember, chloral hydrate is, uh, is a Mickey Finn. Uh, that's four molecules of, uh, of alcohol stuck together. Counseling is usually in the form of group meetings such as Alcoholics Anonymous. Psychedelic abusers are usually white males and under the age of 24. Since only marijuana lends itself to daily use, the treatment is most often focused on the problems that result from the, uh, the abuse. Intoxication, mental disorders, family dynamics, social consequences. Why did you start smoking marijuana and why did you smoke it in such large quantities? Often the initial medical emergency that has to be handled is a bad trip or an acute anxiety reaction, which causes paranoia, fear over loss of control, <clears throat> and feelings of grandeur leading to dangerous behavior. One technique to use in this circumstance is the ARRRT talk down technique. If the technique doesn't seem to be working, medical intervention is needed. PCP and ketamine users will sometimes display violent and even belligerent behavior, even with ARRRT. And we're going to, I'm going to explain to you what ARRRT is right now. The A stands for acceptance. Uh, first, gain the user's trust and confidence. Not the easiest thing in the world, especially with PCP and ketamine. 
since they're paranoid. The second, uh, the, uh, the first R is reduce stimuli, get the user to quiet, uh, to a quiet, non-threatening environment, which isn't the easiest thing in the world if they're paranoid. Uh, the second uh, R is reassure, educate the user that they ex are experiencing a bad trip, assure them that they are in a safe place with safe people, and they will be all right. The third R is rest, help the uh, user relax, use stress reduction techniques such as uh, slow deep breathing or relaxing muscle groups and, and then let them rest. Uh, the last is T for take down, talk down, I'm sorry. <laughs> we don't want to take them down. <laughs> if they're paranoid, that's going to be a problem. Uh, talk them down, discuss peaceful, non-threatening subjects with the user, uh, avoid any topic which seems to create more anxiety or a strong reaction. Uh, talk down, uh, I was just talking to my son the other day, he was talking about one of his students. Uh, he teaches uh, mathematics in, uh, high school mathematics in uh, Florida, and he was talking about talking somebody off the roof. It wasn't, they re really weren't on the roof. What he was doing, he was talking them down. They were, they were ready to quit school, drop out of school, because they didn't understand mathematics. And of course, he had to talk them down. With an increase of the THC in marijuana, more and more individuals have entered treatment for marijuana dependence. Uh, symptoms of marijuana dependence include sleep disturbances, appetite disturbances, headaches, irritability, anxiety, emotional depression, mild tremors, and muscular discomfort. Now remember, marijuana makes you feel good and it gives you uh, the munchies. Uh, it takes away all your pain. Um, it makes you happy. Uh, so what happens when you're not on when you're not smoking marijuana? Well, you can't sleep. You have uh, appetite disturbances. Uh, you have headaches because now, uh, if there was a problem and you would have had a headache, but you're smoking pot, you didn't have it. Uh, so now the headaches are there. You're irritable because it makes you happy when you're smoking pot. So when you're not smoking pot, it makes you grouchy, grumpy. Uh, anxiety, of course, is maybe another reason why you're smoking pot. It reduces your anxiety. Uh, maybe you were depressed, and so you're taking, you're smoking marijuana to uh, to get over your depression. And then, of course, the muscle trim, the mild tremors of muscular discomfort have to do uh, with the fact that it takes away your pain. Uh, I, I don't know if you've ever been around somebody that smokes pot. Uh, but they, they tend to have uh, hand tremors where they can't hold their hands steady. So it looks like, almost like, well, that's not quite as bad as somebody with Parkinson's disease. But they've got this thing where they can't, they just can't hold their hands steady. Here I am, I'm over 70 years old and my hands are steady as a rock. But then again, I've never smoked pot. Cravings for marijuana may last for months or even years. As with most of the behavioral addictions, gamblers tend to be in denial about their problem, feeling that it is more a cash flow problem rather than an, an, an addiction. Most gamblers won't admit that their gambling is a problem until they have hit bottom and they seek treatment to placate their creditors. Gamblers experience withdrawal symptoms that are similar to alcoholism, restlessness, irritability, anger, uh, abdominal pain, headaches, diarrhea, cold sweats, insomnia, tremors, apprehension about well-being, and intense desire to return to gambling. The key to effective eating disorder treatment is early intervention before any permanent damage is done. Diagnose and treat any medical complications. The client should be encouraged to exercise and eat a balanced diet. Use therapies to change false attitudes and perceptions. Encourage attendance at Overeaters Anonymous or other 12-step groups. Use behavioral and group therapies uh, to encourage weight gain or loss. Enhance self-esteem, independence, and development. Treat and educate the whole family. Now, you've got to remember that uh, these individuals are looking for an excuse to continue their addictive behavior. Uh, we're not just talking about eating disorders, but uh, people that smoke pot, people that are drunks, uh, people that uh, use uh, crystal meth, whatever their addiction is, they're always looking for an excuse. So they will troll the, uh, the internet. 
find, trying to find a positive, um, uh, a positive story about uh, about their own addiction. That gambling is good for you. That uh, uh, eating carbs, uh, eating carbs is really good for you, and uh, you can go on a on a carbohydrate diet. Uh, I was working with a doctor one time. And doctors are just, I mean, they're as dumb as everybody else. Uh, this guy was a doctor, and he would go on what he called a pork chop diet, uh, where he didn't eat any any fruits, vegetables, uh, or any starches. And uh, he would lose weight on this pork chop diet, where all he ate was red meat. Well, that's not really good for you. He died of a heart attack, of course, because all he did was eat meat. Uh, and, you know, he'd eat three or four. <laughs> pork chops. <laughs> well, well, I mean, you know, any, anything in moderation, everything, you need to take everything in in moderation. And of course, the problem with an addict is that they are not moderating their, their whatever their addictive behavior is. Okay. Even with intense treatment, only 54% respond to treatment after 12 years. This is Overeaters Anonymous. Are these overeaters, is that what we're talking about? Forgot the key to effective eating disorders. Eating disorders: uh, anorexia, bulimia, and over overeating. Uh, severely ill uh, anorexics must be hospitalized. Nutritional recovery will take as long as ten to twelve weeks because they haven't been taking in enough uh, n uh, nutritious food. They haven't been taking in enough food, and uh, of course, they're not getting the uh, nutrition that they need. The complexities of anorexia require a team approach. The patient will not improve their eating behavior until the underlying depression is treated. Now, the sad thing about anorexics is that uh, these are the individuals that are more likely to die than any other mental illness are anorexics. And because, not because of, well, it is because of the anorexia, but it's, it's usually because of uh, heart complications from uh, the fact that they're not taking in a, enough nutrition. Uh, they, they, they tend to have organ failures, their kidneys shut down, uh, and, and this is because they're not taking in uh, proper uh, uh, nutrition. Of the three eating problems, bulimia is the most difficult to detect because the sufferers tend to be in a normal weight range. So anorexics, are, they look like skeletons. Uh, overeaters uh, are big as barns, uh, but uh, somebody with bulimia, I mean, the only way to tell that somebody's bulimic is if you're in the bathroom when they're throwing up. Unfortunately, due to the intake of foods with high fat and carbohydrate content, atherosclerosis and diabetes are often the result of binge eating. Treatment will require a team of professionals and internists to advise on medical problems, a nutritionist to help with diet and eating patterns, a psychotherapist to change attitudes and behaviors, and a psychopharmacologist to monitor psychoactive medications. People suffering from binge eating uh, disorders seek treatment for both uh, physiological and psychological underlying causes. Current treatment includes counseling sessions that focus on changing attitudes and ideals, uh, examining uh, underlying traumas, uh, recognizing stress and environmental cues, that lead to unhealthy eating habits, uh, pharmacological treatments such as uh, SSRIs, naltrexone, and anti-seizure medication. Uh, sur surgical intervention can be done, bariatric or gastric bypass, uh, where they uh, put a loop. Uh, they, they, they make the stomach smaller by putting a uh, uh, clamp around the stomach, or the, sometimes it's a small intestine. This works. This can really work. The problem is that uh, if your stomach is, doesn't expand like it did in the past, uh, a lot of times, or you can only eat small meals. Uh, you can only eat controlled amounts of, of food. Uh, we had uh, we had an individual in uh, this guy owned all the gas stations in the state. I mean, he was he was really rich, uh, and he was but he was as big as a truck. This guy ate. Uh, everything, everything in sight, he would eat. And he didn't, you know, he wouldn't eat just a steak. He'd eat two or three steaks uh, all, with all the mashed potatoes and, you know, all the French fries or whatever. Uh, so he was killing himself with all the food that he ate. And he had uh, gastric bypass done. And they told him, you're going to have to eat, uh, you can eat several meals, but you have to let your stomach empty. 
and you, they have to be relatively small deals. Well, <clears throat> uh, unfortunately, uh, it, when he was in the hospital, he was okay uh, because they controlled how much food that they gave him. But when he got out, the first thing he did was go and binge, and he blew his stomach out. I mean, I, I know this sounds god awful, uh, and it killed him. Um, so, I mean, the the uh, gastric bypass did did work, and he was losing weight. But of course, he uh, uh, that was part of his addiction was the fact that he ate lots of food at one time, and that's what killed him. Individuals with sex addiction tend to feel extreme shame, guilt, anxiety, and depression. Organizations like Sexaholics Anonymous alleviate the negative feelings by showing the sufferers that there are millions with similar problems and that their behavior is not unique to them. And of course, this is a this is a international problem. Um, the por pornography is the number one reason for people going on the internet. As weird as that sound, no, it's not YouTube and it's not Google. It is uh, it is pornography. Mental health professionals realize that the abstinence model will not work with internet problems since the connectedness has become universal in today's world. Most mental health professionals suggest a harm reduction model. Ten suggestions that might help internet addiction. Move your computer to a different room. Never go online alone. Create an internet usage log to break the isolation. Tell people about your problem. Exercise regularly to overcome sedentary habits. Never use an alias. Take an internet holiday. Stop dwelling and obsessing on internet use. Help someone else control their internet addiction and get professional help. Uh, people are amazed that when I tell them, well, I only check my email once or twice a day. For some people, they get their email instantaneously. They, it's, they get it on their telephones. And if they didn't, of course, they would feel like they were missing something. But, of course, I don't want to be that connected. Uh, I don't want people to control me like that. I mean, it doesn't make any sense to me. I guess I'm not a modern person. I am a dinosaur. I apologize. So if you ever email me and uh, expect me to uh, respond uh, fairly quickly, then if I happen to be on the internet, then I might. Or if I happen to be looking my, at my email, I mean it doesn't it doesn't pop up on my screen just because I have a a, uh, a message. Uh, so it, it may take me hours. Sometimes it may take days for me to answer your emails. Sorry. Male treatment admissions outnumber female admissions two to one. Uh, about 68% males to 32% female. Males are more likely to enter substance treatment through the criminal justice system. However, women tend to progress to addiction more rapidly. They die at a younger age and they're less likely to ask for help or receive it. Now, why in the world would this be? The answer is males are larger than females. We're talking about putting chemicals in, our, in your system. If the male is putting a select amount of uh, drugs in his system and the female is putting exactly the same amount of drugs in her system, because she's smaller, she, it, it uh, doesn't dilute the drugs out as much, and she's more likely to die. Men are more uh, likely to blame external events outside their control for their problems, while women blame their problems on themselves. Treatment often focuses on attacking the denial that many male addicts employ. This merely reinforces the self-blame in women. So women suffer from... The, 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 you, can't, you can't treat males and females the same. You have to treat them differently. Males are in denial. They, they will deny, deny, deny. Uh, and females, of course, will accept the fact that they're, this is a problem, uh, but then they will blame themselves. So then they become very introspective, and now we've got the same problem going on. One guy, is, or the male not, will not admit that he has a problem, and the female admits that she has a problem, and now she's going to go into d depression uh, because of all this self-blame. She'll beat herself up. Men require confrontation, but women actually do better more, with more supportive and less confrontational treatment techniques. Women have to be supported with child care and transportation, whereas these problems are rarely issues with men. The three greatest barriers for women seeking addiction treatment is the inability to, uh, to admit the problem, about 39%, 
lack of emotional support from family members, 32%, inadequate child care while in treatment, 29%. The earlier the onset of drug use in, the indi in an individual, the more likely they will have a drug uh, problem in the future. Uh, delaying alcohol or drug use into the 20s almost completely truncates the, prob the possibility of chemical dependence. Adolescents suffer from drug use because they have less body water fat and fat uh, than adults do. Uh, they, are they have immature enzyme metabolism systems. Uh, if genes dictate addiction, they become addicted immediately after use. They are more vulnerable to environmental stressors. That they have had less time to develop life skills and healthy coping mechanisms. The brain develops slowly from back to front. Uh, the brain isn't adult until age 25. Adolescents are less able to control compulsive drug use. Treatment for adolescents requires that the regimen be broken into smaller, more quickly achieved segments because of a shortened attention span and the inability to process complex information. Adolescents tend to exaggerate the benefits of, the, of an action and denigrate the risks. Adolescents are less likely to accept the advice of an adult over the logic of their peers. Intervention must include their peers. Adolescents tend to use the drugs their peers are using. Drug use is a status symbol. Rave drugs were popular in the 1990s, peaking in 2001 and declining ever since. By 2005, 11.5 million Americans had tried MDMA. This included junior high school students as well as college and high school students. The present generation are more likely to abuse prescription medications. There is a strong association between prescription drug use and the use of alcohol. Adolescents who abuse prescription medications are many times more likely to drift into more serious addictions. Currently, there are 37 million Americans 65 and older, uh, including me. <laughs> Baby boomers were the adolescents on the cusp of the drug movement in the United States. They will be more likely to abuse prescription drugs and alcohol in the future. Of the seniors who present themselves for treatment, 80% are treated for alcohol abuse. Only 17% of the 80% are using a secondary illicit substance. This was not something that was done back in the 1950s and 1960s and 1970s. You didn't use more than one drug. You just got high with whatever you used. Now, I've never been that kind of, I've never been an abuser, uh, so I, I can't speak from experience. Uh, but I know who my friends were and what they were doing. Reasons the elderly abuse drugs, increasing number of illnesses, uh, exposes them to more and more prescription drugs. Physical resiliency declines with age, allowing psychoactive substances to have a greater impact. Physicians maintain many misperceptions about the elderly. Grand grandpa and grandma won't abuse drugs or alcohol. It's too late to address addiction. Seniors have earned the right to abuse drugs. They are either too smart or too burned out to treat. There is uh, not enough time to treat the addiction before they croak. <laughs> I'm sorry. Reasons the elderly abuse drugs, inadequate training in geriatrics and dependency issues. There are age-related physiological problem changes that increase drug toxicity, uh, decreased gastrointestinal acid secretion, motility, and blood flow, decreased lean body mass, decreased plasma albumin to bind to drugs, decreased hepatic blood flow and increased hepatic cell damage, decreased metabolism due to decreased enzymes in the stomach and liver, one-half to two-thirds the metabolic rate of middle-aged adults, uh, decreased kidney function, uh, increased receptor site sensitivity, resulting in more extreme reactions in the brain. Okay, so we've got a real problem with being old. There is an inadequate social and support uh, services for the elderly to alleviate the feelings of isolation and loneliness, retirement, ageism, and inactivity, rejection, disrespect, and abandonment, relationship problems, death of spouse and friends. Uh, my mother uh, lived to be 98 years old. Uh, she was the oldest person. <laughs> she didn't have any friends. 
uh, because they had all died. They all died in their 70s. Some of them made it to their 80s, but uh, she was she was the last person standing. I'll tell you, she they were she didn't know anybody from her childhood. That's for sure. Uh, they were all gone. Decreased satisfaction with the quality of life, financial and housing stress, coming to terms with the chronic illness, pain or impending death, loss of physical appearance and abilities, frustration over memory loss. The community enables the elderly to manage their own problems. <sighs> Treatment for the elderly takes a different tack than uh, from the general po for the general population. The elderly react more positively in groups than individual treatment. Uh, they respond better in groups their own age, but can flourish in groups with mixed ages as well. Withdrawal symptoms for the elderly tend to be more severe, but can usually be managed successfully. The elderly are more likely to suffer cognitive impairment from their substance use. African Americans represent 12% of the U.S. population but 22.1% of the admissions at substance abuse treatment facilities. Male African Americans outnumber females in treatment 3 to 1. Female admissions are more likely to involve hard drugs, while males are more likely to involve alcohol. African Americans seek treatment for marijuana use at a high level, 22% of male admissions, and 6.6% of female admissions. Unfortunately, African American uh, completion rates are below the national average at 17%. Point five percent. Why? Why do they have lower com completion rates? They have a higher pain threshold, which means that they are less likely to reach out for help, and therefore they enter therapy with with more severe addictions. In inner city neighborhoods, drugs represent an economic resource, making them more acceptable in the community. Crime is the first step into the drug subculture in the inner city. Uh, strong sense of boundaries where intervention is an encroachment and violates personal choice. Uh, chemical dependency is often seen as a secondary problem to the environmental issues of living in the inner city. A conspiracy that such epidemic problems as crack and AIDS have swept through African American communities are pla as planned genocide. And of course, uh, with this COVID-19 uh, outbreak, uh, the people that are dying at higher rates our minorities, our poor people, uh, as we've seen, it is something that is sweeping uh, through the Navajo Nation. Uh, it's also so the the 30 33 percent of the people that are have uh, died in New York City are were black. Uh, Seventeen percent were Hispanic. So it's devastating the minority population more than the white population. And this may be a reason. This is one of the reasons why you need to watch the news uh, to see who these individuals are that want the economy turned back on because these individuals are mostly white uh, and they're not suffering like everybody else is suffering. Well, not nearly as much. There are white deaths, my goodness gracious. To say there isn't would be in inaccurate. The strength of the organized spirituality has helped promote recovery in the African-American community. Currently, 14.4% of the population is Hispanic and represent 13.7% uh, of the population in substance abuse treatment. Alcohol is a substance that was abused to lead to treatment for Hispanics. 77% of admissions among Hispanics for treatment are male. There's a shock for you. One challenge for treatment facilities is to understand the vast diversity among Hispanics in the United States to be culturally sensitive to the different groups. Uh, okay, so the two major groups in the United States are uh, Puerto Ricans and uh, people of Mexican descent, uh, but there are also people from all the countries of South America and Central America. Uh, all of these individuals have different cultures. Uh, if you're from El, if you're Salvadorian, if you're Nicaraguan, uh, I had a, a friend in California uh, who was Nicaraguan. I, and, you know, I, I'm not even thinking. Not even thinking that uh, that he I knew he was Hispanic, but I had no idea that he was from Nicaragua. Fascinating individual. Cubans, of course, in, in, especially in Florida. Uh, so we have uh, people from all over, uh, uh, people from all over South and Central America and and North America as well. Uh, Mexico is part of North America. 
Okay, so what you need to do when you're confronting somebody who's Hispanic, don't assume that they're Mexican because uh, you know they may they may have uh, a brown skin, but that doesn't mean that they're from from Mexico. Uh, and sometimes that'll get you punched in the nose, so you got to be careful. Uh, don't don't assume. <laughs> How about that? This can be done by attempting to gauge the level of enculturation represented in their in their client. Uh, of all the groups in the United States, Asians and Pacific Islanders represent the most diverse group. This group literally represents all but the American Indian race in the world and some of the oldest cultures in the world. Treatment has to, to take into account length of time in the United States, as well as cultural and intergenerational conflicts in therapy. Asians are more likely to respond to licensed professionals rather than lay persons lay peers. Asian cultures tend to separate males and females and therefore mixed groups are less effective. Profe protection of family honor is a high priority among most Asians and therefore the counselor will see a high level of family enabling and rescuing that delays the addict's entry into treatment. Therefore any treatment plan delay uh, dealing uh, with Asians must include family treatment as well. Drug use by nationality from most serious to, to less serious. Uh, Chinese tend to, uh, to abuse tobacco and alcohol. The Japanese, alcohol, marijuana, tobacco, crack cocaine, methamphetamines. Koreans, alcohol and crack cocaine. Filipinos, alcohol, marijuana and cocaine. Vietnamese, tobacco, marijuana and alcohol. Cambodians, alcohol, tobacco, crack cocaine, smokable methamphetamines. Half of all American Indians in the United States live in Arizona, but as a population, they represent the most diverse group of any of the racial groups. The bet noir uh, for uh, American Indians seems to be alcohol as 58.5% of admissions into treatment facilities deals with alcohol as compared to only 39 0.2% among the general U.S. population. Su successful treatment often involves being culturally sensitive to more traditional American Indians. However, since over 60% of American Indians live away from their traditional lands, level of cultural adherence should be gauged to facilitate treatment. That is something that you have to remember. If somebody was raised in Flagstaff or somebody's raised in Phoenix, they may not have the same cultural understanding. Uh, that people on the reservation have. Um, if they're from another tribe, uh, they probably have a different idea of what their, of, of the culture, of what their culture is. It's certainly not the same as, as, uh, as Navajos. So you've got to be really, really careful when you're dealing with somebody who you know is an American Indian. They may be Shawnee, they could be, they could be Sioux, they could be Ho-Chunk. Uh, they can be just about anything, and so you need to be really, really careful. Uh, when you don't assume that they're going to accept your idea of culture, um, or that they have a strong culture themselves. One group that is heavily represented in uh, drug and alcohol treatment is a much maligned lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender community, LGBT. Uh, 20 to 35 percent of this community reports heavy alcohol use compared to 10 to 12 percent in their heterosexual community. Why so? Why do why do so many uh, people uh, that are not uh, are not straight? Why in the world do they drink so much? It's because they feel like they are different, and because they've been different all of their lives. Uh, this is one of the uh, ways that they need it to uh, alleviate that feeling of difference. Uh, so alcohol, just like anybody else, a lot of people, they are dodging their problems uh, or dodging the society's uh, ideas of them. Uh, so they drink, they smoke, they uh, drop acid, they, they take drugs. Part of the LGBT lifestyle in urban settings often involves bar scenes and parties that promote drug and alcohol use. However, researchers have determined that a greater predictor of alcohol and drug abuse in the LGBT community are genetics and childhood stress. And of course, where does the childhood stress come from? They are different. 
they are in the closet. Uh, potentially, they're in the closet. And for that reason, of course, they have a difficult time dealing uh, with these problems, with the problems, and that creates the stress. And all that stress, of course, comes out later on in life uh, as, uh, as an addiction. One of the difficulties in dealing with LGBT community is involving the family of the sufferer in the treatment. Often these individuals are either in the closet or estranged from their families. Um, when I was going through uh, training, uh, one of the individuals that I was uh, in training with uh, was a lesbian lady that wanted to be a counselor. And she wanted to be a counselor for her, what she referred to as her people. Um, and and it, was, it was interesting dealing with her because uh, she always, uh, she seemed to have a chip on her shoulder for one thing, uh, which was really kind of irritating. Uh, but the other thing was that, uh, that uh, this was, she claimed that only somebody who understood, had been, in, had been there could understand uh, what the situation was. Not that she was, she'd been an alcoholic, but she was, uh, she was a lesbian and she felt that she understood the whole community. But uh, there was also a ma male there who was, who was uh, gay, and he claimed that uh, the worst, the people that are the meanest to gay males are, are lesbians. And so he claimed that uh, uh, it had to be somebody from his community to, to deal with, uh, with uh, individuals that are gay. A uh, real interesting argument. Uh, we never resolved it. The two of them were at each other's throat practically throughout the, the entire uh, training sessions that we, that we had. Um, and oddly, I was a, uh, a conduit between the two of them uh, because people, or the, well, each, the lesbian lady really didn't like males at all. She didn't want to have anything to do with any males. Uh, but the, the gay male was, uh, was uh, uh, he, he couldn't find anybody else to talk to. And since I didn't, since I'm not that hard to talk to, he, uh, he found me easier to talk to. Interesting, huh? Anyway, we, we became a conduit. I, she, she hated all males, but for some reason, I guess I'm, I'm a non-threatening male. So I was, I was the individual she chose to, uh, to deal with. She wouldn't deal with any of the straight females. It was really kind of odd. She hated the, uh, the uh, counselor. She said the counselor was prejudiced. Really kind of odd. The biggest obstacles in treatment are denial and lack of financial resources. Uh, many users have delayed emotional development due to the effects of the psychoactive substances, which keeps them from learning how to deal with life's problems. It is an empirical fact that brain cells are damaged when using psychoactive substances, which leads to cognitive deficits during the first several months of abstinence. I've talked about meth head. Uh, it takes about 18 months for your brain to, to repair itself uh, so that you can function at the same level you did before you started using meth. But it's the same way. It's not quite as bad as, as uh, meth head, uh, but most of the addictive substances will cause an intellectual deficit to, to a minor degree. 30 to 80 percent of substance abusers have mild to severe cognitive impairment, as I just said. It is possible that some recovering clients may not comprehend the interventions that are being used with them. Uh, for this reason, uh, most difficult and abstract concepts are uh, presented at the end of treatment where the client is more likely to comprehend the concepts. And that is the end. So that is the only lecture for this week. Uh, I'll see you guys next week. Stay safe. Stay home. Be good. Uh, talk, to you, talk to you next week.